Yeah, Bible in the pew. Okay, I'm going to give you a page number here in a minute. Okay, 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. Got a lot of stuff to go over this morning. Is there a Steeler game on at 1 o'clock? Good. Is there, is there one, John Paul? You're going to be here long. I'm going to look at John Paul. He'll be on his phone over there watching the game still. <laughs> Get him, Lori. Start, start pinching his neck. Now, we're going we're gonna to get going here. A lot of scripture there, all right? Pray that God blesses it. And let's see. 1 Thessalonians, that's page number 1572. Okay, 1572, if you have a Bible in the pew. 1572. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13. That's page uh, 1572, starting off at verse number 13. Okay, second, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It's a good verse here. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus in their own prophets and have persecuted us. They, uh, and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. What group of people would forbid such people to speak to Gentiles? What group of people there? The Jewish people. Look, ain't that something? Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is come upon them, the Jews, to the uttermost. That, that word uttermost means to an extreme high degree. All right, let me just pray real quick. Dear Lord God, I just pray for the gift of teaching and preaching this morning. I pray that you help me, help the words that I speak. Um, just anoint my lips, Lord, and I just pray that the word goes forth and uh, just sets on, on, into the hearts of the hearers this, this morning. Pray that you open up our eyes to your scriptures, give us wisdom and understanding to the uh, topic that we undertake this morning, and we thank you for it, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can be seated. Now, for the past weeks, we've been studying, uh, doing a study on the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Okay, most know that, that there's a war going on right now in Israel. And my encouragement has been and always is and always will be uh, to analyze everything that you hear, everything that you see going on around you. Go back to that Bible and see what the Bible has to say about things, okay? That way you can't be deceived about what's going on in, in the world. So you say, well... You know, you're, you're preaching current events. Well, yeah, I am. Now, isn't the, isn't the Bible a book of current events? Or is this just an old dead book that isn't relevant for today? The Bible is full of current events. Okay, matter of fact, it's way ahead. It tells you the outcome of current events. It's, it's, it's amazing, okay? And uh, the, more, the more that I get to know this book and read it and study it, the more I, I do thank God especially talking with people and dealing with people, the more I really thank God that we have absolute truth. We have absolute truth, something that we can count on, something that's that stood the test of time, something that's uh, sure, it's solid, something, just something that can be counted on. What, what are you going to count on in this day and age to give you the truth? What are you going to count on? TikTok, Instagram, social media, Facebook, CNN, Fox, Count on Fox. You gonna count on that? You're gonna count on news media to get you to, to get you the truth. You know, so that, that's the, the old saying goes. Uh, an old saying: if if you don't watch the news, you're 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 uninformed. If you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. But if you watch the news, you're misinformed. <laughs> that's just about. That's pretty much just about right. And uh, the, just as, like I said, the 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 more and more I think about it, if God didn't give us an absolute standard of truth by which we judge all things going on, life would be pointless. It would be a big, confused mess. It would be, be pointless. It would be in such a, a, a state of confusion all the time. And uh, th this, this book has all the answers 
that you need. It has all the answers that we need to know. And you say, well, you know, what, what, what is the answer? Well, the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. We, that was our Bible verse card that we studied last Thursday night. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, so you, you, the, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then you, you ought to get to know him. You have to know him. And, uh, and you say, well, you know, who, who is he? What, what is he? What, what's the big deal? He's God. He's God. That's what the Bible teaches. He's God manifest in the flesh. The same God that created the heaven and the earth. The same God that flung out all these stars and all these galaxies. And the same God that created this world, created the animals, created mankind, created us. That's where we come from. God, our creator. He came down in the form of a man. That's Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. And if, if you live this life without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, then you miss the entire purpose and meaning of life. You missed it. You missed it all. And uh, you say, well, what, what, well you know, the, the purpose of life is to get a job, to have a family, have a wife, have a kids, have a nice house, have a nice big boat, have nice cars. That's not the meaning of life. It's not the purpose of life. We say, what is, what is the purpose of life? Well, Jesus Christ claimed it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's, there's life right there. That's the purpose of life. And what's the problem, obviously, is your, your problem is sin. It's a shame. People... You know, we, we, we tend to love our sin more than Jesus Christ. And that's what, act, uh, you know, obviously hinders people from coming to Christ is because they love their sin. You know, pick, pick whatever sins you want to pick, lying, stealing, cheating, adultery, pornography, smoking dope, drinking alcohol, cussing, you know, backbiting, pride, self-righteousness. All that stuff, it hinders us from coming to Christ. We, we, don't, want the, we don't want the spotlight. Who, who likes getting woken up in the morning by somebody shining a 30,000 lumen light right on your eyes. Nobody likes that. And that's what the Bible does. It shines light of our sinful condition. And at first we resist it. We try to put the blankets over us. We try to cover it. We try to hide from it. But eventually you're going to be confronted with it. You've got to make a decision about that. Okay. And uh, sin it blinds people from seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we all have sinned. It's just to get over that initial, I guess, that initial hurdle. Hey, man, I'm a sinner. You know, man, once you make that confession, now, now we can get into the, you know, the gospel. The Bible says that all have sinned. The Bible says that we're all sinners. And uh, the Bible says if, if, if it wasn't for what God done for us, we'd all be in hell. Every single one of us. I don't care how good you think you are. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. I don't care how self-righteous you think you are, there's, there's, no, there's none. There's only one perfect righteous righteousness, and that's the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, if it wasn't for, for the grace of God, you know, God gave us an escape route. He gave us a, a free gift. He gave us a, a, a sacrifice for our sins so that we don't have to go to hell. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And if you never heard that before, uh, the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins, for our sins, according to the scripture, and then he was buried, and then he resurrected the third day, according to the scriptures. So that's what God did for sinners. That's the gospel. And you say, well, what happens if I don't receive that? Well, if you don't receive it, you're just you're going to go to hell. That's just what the book says. Okay, that's what it says. God, God can give you the cure. He could hold it out in front of you. He could show you and point you to the way to the escape route. He could point you to the door. He could tell you I'm the door. But it's up to you to take the cure. It's up to you to go through the escape route. So at the end of the day, people say, you know, what a mean, horrible, terrible God, you know, sending people to hell and stuff like that. He gives you. A, he he told you. He gave you a way out. He gave you a free gift. And if you don't want to take that stuff, he'll let you go to hell if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's all. That's just how it is. You 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 send yourself to hell and things like that for rejecting God's free gift of salvation, His death, burial, and resurrection for for sinners. So uh, if you're not saved, anybody that's listening at all, if you're not saved and you never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then there's no better day than today. Don't put it off. That's what's important. I mean, we're going to see some stuff going on in the end times again. And this thing is coming to a boiling point. It's about to boil over. You know, it's really uh, it's about to pop off, you know, as, as people would say and stuff. So I don't care if you were raised in the church, grew up in the church. Uh, there's a lot of people that think the church can save them. Church can't save you. I can't save you. Your pastor, you know, he can't save you. Your priest or whatever. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can save you. That's it. That's it. Not of works, you know, not, nothing that you can do to save your soul. 
Okay, you can't climb your way in heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. Christ already did the works for you. He put the finishing touches on it. It's done. It's complete. All you have to do is re receive the free gift. I trust you, Lord. I'm taking you at his word. Everybody else lies in this world. I'm taking you at your word. And the Bible says God, God is not a man that he should not lie. Okay, neither the son of man that he should not repent. So hath he spoken and shall he not do it? You know, hath he said and shall it not come to pass? Yeah, what God says is going to come to pass. What God said is true. So that's what, what everybody has to make that decision in their life to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's a blessing. So amen. So for our uh, remaining time we have together, I'd like to finish the lesson uh, with uh, the nation of Israel. And we're going to conclude with uh, prophecy and peace of Israel. That's the two main things I'm going to look at. The prophecy, that's just a fancy word for the foretelling of the future. The prophecy and the peace of Israel. And we're going to talk about that. Now, uh, we read this passage here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sin all way, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Let me ask you all a question. Know your Bible at all. Is God done with the Jewish people? Is he done with them? Did he just cast them away and the church replaced Israel? Now we're the, you know, amen. He did not. Unless you have the Amplified Bible. Okay, unless you have one of them other perversions, the 430 other perversions, God only gave us one book. He gave us the King James Bible. It's perfect, without error. And the, but the best way, if I was the devil and I was trying to infiltrate Christianity, I'd do it from the inside. I would try to go in there. I'd try to corrupt the word. And I'd come out with a bunch of confusion and a bunch of Bible versions and translations. So we don't know what God said at the end of the day. So you're just scratching around in darkness through the rest of your life. Thank God we have a perfect book. But if you have the Amplified Bible, here's something that it says here. It says, forbidding us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. So as always, they fill up to the brim the measure of their sins allotted to them by God. But God's wrath has come upon them at last, completely and forever. There's your old Amplified Bible. There's a big difference of the wrath of God's come upon somebody to the uttermost. I had it about, I'm, I'm up to here with you. You know, you hear that saying. But at the end of the day, you should have forgiveness. You should, you should things should calm back down and you should, there should be restoration there at the end of the day. There's a big difference of the wrath of God's filled up to, on his Jewish people to the uttermost compared to I'm done with you forever and completely. <laughs> so that book teaches that God's all done with the, with, the, with the Jewish person, with the nation of Israel. That's a lie. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 24 in one hand. Matthew chapter 24. Uh, do have a lot of scripture. If, if to Try to do your best to listen. I know I try to encourage everybody to flip and turn, but Matthew chapter 24, this is the words of Jesus Christ concerning the end of the world. Pretty, uh, pretty big topic, you know. I'd say that's a pretty interesting topic. Most people would probably be interested in well, well, the, the end of the world, you know. Scientists are looking for it, and the sun's going to burn out, and the ozone layer's getting thin, the polar ice caps are melting, and what is that? Don't they have a clock on, online that tells us you know, what the doomsday clock? You know, they even have a doomsday clock, and you say, who is it? Are these religious people? Well, they're scientists, you know, that are, you no know, doubt they're religious, but Matthew 24, 12, here's what the Lord says. Matthew 24, page 1283, the book of Matthew Okay, page 1283, if you have a Bible in the pew. Matthew 24. Okay, let's see. If you're, if you're quick enough, let's go to Matthew 24 in one hand. I'll try to get some, some passages laid out real quick. Matthew 24 in one hand. Revelation chapter 6 in the other hand. And then in your third hand, Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. We'll get it all together here in a minute. So we got Matthew chapter 24. That's why I recommend anybody that got a Bible, their personal Bible, you gotta have, you gotta have at least five bookmarkers hanging out on that thing. You go. It it it, it came it came with two, but you could go down and get you some good old little ribbon. Jerry and fabrics, you know, and go get some ribbon and super glue them things right back in. So now you got now you got five bookmarkers. Daily reading, Old Testament, Proverbs, New Testament, Bible study and passages. So that's, that's always a little 
Bible study note there. Let's see, Matthew 24, that's page 1283. And we're going to look at Revelation chapter 6, that's page 1650. Page 1650. All right, Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto you, Take heed that no man deceive you. A lot of deception. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, wars going on, and rumors of wars. You know, oh, so-and-so is about to attack this country, and China's about to take over Taiwan, and Russia's about to is finishing Ukraine, and Russia and, I, and, and Iran's going to team up, and they're going to go against Israel. Israel's at war. I mean, we're, you're, we're hearing a lot of this stuff. You know, wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. So a Christian has no business of being troubled about these things. The Bible already tells us how it's going to end. <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, it's, it, it's a spoiler alert, I guess. It spoils the end of how things go. We know it. It's a blessing. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. How many kingdoms are there? There's a physical kingdom and a spiritual kingdom. So they, there, there's a lot of physical stuff going on, but there's stuff going on in the spiritual realms too. And there shall be famines. Okay, and pestilences, and earthquakes, and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. It's just starting. All right, and we're going to show, I'm going to show you, a, then it talks about, you know, we could read some more stuff. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. Uh, many shall be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Uh, many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Verse 11, verse 12. What's the reason of all this? Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. I mean, I pray that doesn't even happen in, with, with Christian people, that our, that our hearts start waxing cold because iniquity is all around us and it desensitizes us to love. You know, lo love one another. Lo love, your, love your wife. Lo lo love your husband. Love your, your family. Lo love your, your friends and things like that. Don't grow cold on people. But look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness of, unto all nations, and then the end shall come. We're not under the gospel of the kingdom. This passage is not written directly to us. It's written to the Jews. Okay, that's, that's some stuff you've got to know too. Verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. And then in parentheses, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in where? Judea. Are you in Judea? We're not in Judea. We're in, right now we're in Plum Borough. Okay, we have no business of being in Judea at the end of the day. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop. You know, I say a lot, but when's the last time you hung on a housetop? You don't hang out on the top of your roofs in, over in America. They do in the Middle East, though. They got their rooftops and, you know, gardens and all that stuff and things like that. Let, let them be on the housetop, not come down to take anything out of his house. Uh, let's see. Let's keep going down a little bit. Skip some. Well, verse 19. Woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. It's going to be tough to have a uh, baby. baby. There's going to be a big baby food shortage uh, during, a, during the tribulation period. But when ye pray that your flight be, uh, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now look at verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. That's just, that's, tribulation is an extreme disaster, okay? Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So the, Lord, the Lord's telling you, he'd go on and read the rest of this passage, but come to Revelation chapter 6, okay? So the Lord Jesus just told, told us some stuff there about the end of the world and some signs about what to look out for. And he, he pretty much summed this thing up and said, there's never been a time like this, and there's never going to be a time after this that's so bad. So that's, what we, that's what's coming up on the, on the forecast is, is a very tough time, okay? Look at Revelation chapter 6. 
Revelation chapter 6 now, this is interesting, okay? We're, we're in the middle of the tribulation, just for, for some doctrinal stuff. The church, okay, the rapture happens. The Christians, they're caught out. They vanish, they disappear in thin air. They're caught out, okay? John is a great picture of that. Uh, but chapter 6 shows up, okay? Now this is, this is like the beginning here. This is actually like the beginning of sorrows, what Jesus Christ is saying. And I, and I know, you know, we're guilty on, you know, we try to apply things from the book of Matthew 24 and try to squeeze it until today. But doctrinally speaking, I, I believe that Matthew 24, it's all about tribulation. I mean, it's, so, you know, you, we do got to get that too. But look at Revelation 6, verse number 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, Revelation 6, And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Ain't that something? So a guy shows up on a white horse. Now, you know what's interesting? You know who, who's looking for their, their Mahdi right now? The Muslims. There's talk, you know, we're all interested in, like, the, the Jewish people. They're looking for their Messiah to show up. And uh, who, who is their Messiah? Jesus Christ. But this conflict that's going on with these Muslims, right now they're, they're putting signs up. They're looking for their Mahdi. And who, their Mahdi is the same guy as the Jews' Messiah. The Buddhists, we talked about it before, they're looking for this figure to show up, the fifth Buddha. The New Agers, they're looking for a guy named... Uh, Lord Maitreya, uh, the Hindus, they're looking for this god Vishnu to come up on the scene to solve all the world's problems. You know, and Scientologist people, they're looking for the aliens to come down, and the Elon Musk, they're looking for whatever AI, artificial intelligence to solve all the problems or whatever. But it's interesting, this white horse, many people would say this is the Antichrist, shows up, could be, probably is, could be the Mahdi also. It could be that, that, that Muslim... Uh, uh, Messiah, so to say, uh, that shows up. But look at verse 3. So this guy went going forth conquering into conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Interesting. I mean, we know of a religion that goes by and kills people with swords for not converting to their religion. That's a Muslim, you know. Uh, it's interesting how swords and stuff get brought up in the book of Revelation and horseback riding and things like that. Um, but it was given to this, this red horse shows up on the scene, and it's to take peace from the earth. Okay, so it's interesting how like this white horse, he shows up with a bow, a, 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 just a bow. It don't say there's arrows in it. So it's like the guy's coming in like, you know, he comes in peaceably, and yet he's conquering at the same time. I don't know how he does it. they got political ties or whatever. I don't know how that goes about. But then it's, then it's true color show, verse 4, that now, now the sword comes out. Now there is killing. Then verse 5, uh, the third seal, okay, a third beast. Come and see, I beheld it blow a, a black horse, and he sat on him, and he had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts, a measure of wheat, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And, and that's like equivalent to like a day's, work, a day's wage. Imagine working all day long. You work your whole earnings for one day's earnings will just get you a loaf of bread. That's bad. That's bad. Okay. That, 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 this is, and obviously what, what happens when war happens, then famines follow. Okay. And um, let's see, look at verse number six. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, a measure of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Well, there's going to be some people in charge of gas and food or something like that, and wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth, be uh, fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And look who's on this thing. And his name that sat on there, on him was death and hell followed him and power was given unto him was given unto them to over to uh, over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword with hunger they're controlling the food with death 
and with the beasts of the earth. Somehow they're getting the animals to turn on people. That's, this is wild stuff. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the, uh, under the uh, altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And um, let's see, come to verse number 12. And I beheld, and lo, the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great, what, earthquake. Okay? And the sun became black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood. Stars of heaven fell from earth. Now, remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said? Wars, rumors of wars, uh, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Well, these horsemen match up pretty well with what he just talked about. Almost to a T here, okay? Now, it's interesting, you know, people are talking about this, this world war. We're, we're on the brink of war. And, yeah, we, we've never been so close to World War III than today. You know, that's, that's some pretty wild stuff. And if uh, we have a Bible in our hands, which we do, the Bible tells you there's going to be a total of five world wars by the time human history is done. We've had two. There's going to be five of them. And I'll, I'll briefly go over them real quick, but what's, what's the number of, what's the number, what's five represent in the Bible? Death. Okay, death. Uh, for example, you know, just Satan, S-A-T-A-N, five letters. Devil, D-E-V-I-L, five letters. Death, D-E-A-T-H, five letters. Uh, the international distress signal, when, when a plane's going down or when a boat's going down, what do they say? Mayday, mayday, mayday. January, February, March, April, May. Why not June day? You know, so there's all these little weird number patterns that that God kind of throws uh, throws out there. Here's a big one. How many wounds did the Lord Jesus Christ have? One, two, both feet, three, four, one in the side, five wounds. And yeah, that 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 death did bring about grace. G R A C E. So there, there's a there's a close many many Bible scholars would say five is the number of grace, but I would say five is the number of death primarily. But with that death did bring some grace. So uh, that's pretty amazing. But there's, there's going to be a total of five world wars. Okay, so there's definitely going to be a world war. That, that guy killed a fourth part of the earth. That's what the Bible says. Okay, and, and, and I, well, I did the statistics on it before. If the total population right now is 7.7 uh, .7 billion, and right here kills a fourth part, well, that's, that's 1.9 billion gone. So that brings the world population at this time to 5.8 billion. That's a lot of death. Right out the gate, a big war blows off. And you're going to have a world war going on here, okay, in the tribulation. So that would, that would be your World War III. People were talking about Russia and Iran and China and Taiwan and the United States and all that stuff. Well, there's going to be a war, okay. Then World War Number Four takes place when, you know, I like that sticker, Don Nesbitt, you know, John, or Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, death from above. Air Calvary. <laughs> the Lord comes back with, uh, with, with, with an army from heaven and destroys the Antichrist's kingdom. He wipes all that out. That's a world war. You had the whole world at one time worshiping the beast, the devil, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and they, they're, they're at war, destroys them, and then the Lord Jesus sets his thousand-year reign up. Okay, right? He sets up his kingdom on earth. The Bible says it's going to be a thousand years. Here's where the good stuff really happens. Okay? Thousand-year reign. Then what happens at the end of the thousand-year reign? Another war. <laughs> the devil gets released from the bottomless pit and goes out in the four corners of the world, Gog and Magog, and deceives them people. And then there's another war. It's, it's the biggest war, but it's the quickest war. God, the devil gets all the, the, the number is the sand of the sea and encompasses the camp, which is Jerusalem. And the devil's like, I, I got him, I got him. You know what I mean? He got him all surrounded. Where are you going to go? And Lord Jesus Christ, it, it, there's one sentence that says, and, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So he bunched them all up just to get them all nice and close so they're easier to burn. <laughs> you know, and it was the biggest world war is the quickest. So there's, a, there's five world war, uh, a total of five world wars going on. Now, let's see. Let's look at Jeremiah 6, okay? If that, you had that third hand in there somewhere. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number uh, 7. Okay, that's page 1026, prophet of Jeremiah. Okay, let's look at that, page 1026. Page 1026. Now let's, uh, let's look at this here. Jeremiah chapter 30, page 1026.
page 1026, chapter 30, verse number 7. Now let's look at this. It says, Alas, for that, for that day is great, so that none is like it. You can't even compare to anything else. It is even, okay, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob, everybody? Israel. That's what we've been learning about. Jacob is Israel. So it is the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble. Okay, but he shall be saved out of it. There's going to be a remnant of these Jewish people saved out of this, out of that, that time period. Um, let's see, look at verse number 11. Come down to verse 11. This is all, this is a very great chapter. I don't know if we've got time to go through all of it. Um, go scan your eyes over to verse number 6 real quick because I know this is going to tie up with what, what I want to talk about here in a minute. But look at Jeremiah 30, verse 6. Ask now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? Okay, and all, and all faces uh, are turned to paleness. Pretty, uh, pretty wild scene there. But come to verse 11. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of how many nations? All nations, whither I have scattered thee. Last week we talked about the history of Israel and how God tells them, because of your disobedience, I'm going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth and things like that. And we looked up some statistics of where these Jewish people are. Remember, when it says, I'm, I, I am with thee, who's he talking to? Israel. To save thee, he's talking about Israel. Though I will make a full end of all nations. So people say, well, where's America? Well, there we are. <laughs> Where are the all nations? I'm going to make an end of all nations. There's America in Bible prophecy for you. We're gone. We're off the map. We don't, we, I'm going to make a full end of all nations, whether I have, where, whether I have scattered thee. What's the, what's the biggest country that houses Jews today? America. More than even in Israel. We, we saw that statistic last week. That's, a, that's wild. Yet will I not make a full end of thee, speaking of Israel, but I will correct thee in measure, and I will not leave thee altogether unpunished. I got to whip you. I got to punish you. You, you. you crucified your Messiah. You, you killed me when I showed up on the scene. You rejected me completely. I can't leave that unpunished. I have to dish out judgment, okay? Now, uh, it looks like when the USA you know, dumps the, the Jewish people uh, and turns against Israel, it looks like God's going to dump America and uh, make a full end of, of this country. Ain't that, ain't that something? Uh, you know, we, we, we housed his people for hundreds of years, and God blessed us for it. That's one of the big reasons why God did bless this land that we're living in, because we took care of the Jewish person. We, we took them into our land. Now, I'm thinking about this Palestinian stuff. We don't have to go too far off. They're supposed to be Muslims, okay? And we, we looked at the map and stuff. Israel got this little land, and they're fighting over that, that little Palestinian state stuff. Muslims. And you got there's, Israel surrounded by Muslim nations. You don't want to take any of your brothers and sisters in. <laughs> that land belongs to the Jews. You know, if you love your people enough, you, Egypt don't want them. These, and that's, that's sad. So don't get me wrong. That, that's sad. These people need the gospel too, the, these Palestinians. They need saved too. We, we, we should understand that. But, man, you got Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria, Egypt. You got all these, and nobody wants this little group of Palestinians. The land belongs to the Jewish people. You Muslims should help out and take your people. We're going to be the ones getting them, probably. <laughs> come on over, you know, come on over to America. You know, we're, we'll, 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 take all, we'll take them all. And that's very, very odd. But anyways, um, so it looks like, though, what's gonna, what may happen is uh, God blessed us for that, taking care of the Jew. But when we begin to curse the Jew for all the evil that it's done in the world, well, then we better watch out. Okay, we better watch out because God will, will dump us like that. Come to Numbers 23, very interesting passage. And look, I, I understand the Jewish people are wicked. They're wicked. They're under a curse. We looked at that and stuff. But you got to be careful. We got to be careful because we, we could see nowadays in colleges and on news medias, all whatever, is they are trying to get people to go against that Jewish person. They're saying, no, the land belongs to 
the Palestinians, these poor Palestinians that, that you know, the, the, they never had a state. They never existed as a state. They were nomadic people. Uh, you know, the same people that they're, I don't want to get too, you know, I'll be stepping all kinds of toes. Same thing as Americans coming over to the Native American land. We'd be in big trouble. Any news person that says, you know, oh, they took their land. What did, what did we do? <laughs> we, we came over here and eradicated a, a group of people, put them in some camps. Horrible stuff. You can't justify that. Bad stuff. Took their land, you know, maybe helped them out a little bit and made ourselves a, a land and made ourselves a people and became America, you know, and people, you know, weren't worried about, oh, we, you know, Palestinians, Israel, they came in, they took their land. Uh, you got to be careful with this stuff. Look at Numbers 23, verse 21. Look at Numbers 23, 21 here. Numbers 23, 21. That's page 261. Numbers 23, while we're in the, in the same ballpark, look at verse number 19. That's the verse I just quoted earlier. It's a good one. Though. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Everything that God said in this book is going to come to pass whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not. Or hath he spoken and shall, it, shall he not make it good? Shall not the, shall not the judge of the whole, whole world do right? He will. That's what Abraham said. That's a good thing to know about our God, whether we can't fathom it and how's this all working out. He's going he's gonna to make it good. You know, he's gonna, it's going to work out to the counsel of his will. Look at Numbers 23, 20. Behold, I have received commandments to bless, and he hath blessed. And I cannot reverse it. Now look at verse 21. This is amazing. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of this stuff has things with the second coming. Imagine God saying, I, I, Israel, these people are a wicked mess. Rejection and, and, and paganism and idolatry and Illuminati stuff and all of this wicked things that the, the Zionist bankers and whatever they're going, you know, whatever they got going on, you know, doing. And at the end of it, God says, "I don't behold iniquity in Jacob." And if you want a good little devotional nugget, I always put my name in there. When God looks upon me, I, I have not beheld iniquity in in Vincent. <laughs> he has not beheld iniquity in me. You say, "What do you mean? I'm a I'm a sinner. I got the wrath of God is upon me to the uttermost." But when He saved me, God looks down. He sees His record of His Son. You know, I have not found perverseness in me. My record's covered. You know, so that, that's, the, that's a blessed doctrine of imputed righteousness. I'm covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and my sins were dumped on him at the cross. He descended in hell and probably dumped them off there and then ascended, resurrected the third day, all that beautiful stuff. But that's a, that's a, that's a cool thing. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, so that's the that's second coming. Now, Come to Zechariah chapter 14, some more prophets stuff here about the prophecy of Israel. Okay, look at Zechariah 14. All right, I'll give you a page number in a second. Zechariah 14, that's page number 1224. All right, let's look at this. 1224. Okay, page 1224. Look at Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 1. It says this, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. We're, at, we're, we're in Jerusalem here. We're in Israel. Okay, thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Look at verse 2. For I will gather how many nations? All nations against Jerusalem to battle. It's going to happen. And the city shall be taken. The Jews are going to end up losing this war eventually. Okay? In the battle. In the, in, in the city, Jerusalem, shall be taken. And the houses rif uh, rifled and the woman ravished. Half the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. 
as whom he fought in the day of battle. Remember that verse in Exodus chapter 15 somewhere? What's it say? The Lord is a man of war. Believe that. The Lord is a man of war. And you're fighting against Israel. You're fighting against the Jewish person. You're fighting against God. You think you're going to win that battle? <laughs> At the end, you may look, it may look like you're going to win. There's some things that are going to get played out there. Uh, then you can see verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So let me just give you a brief little rundown, a little recap. The Lord Jesus Christ, he had a first coming to die for everybody's sins, buried, resurrected. You have about 2,000 years of church age, the body of Christ, those that believe on the Lord Jesus and all that. We're right here. We're at the very end of it. We're at the, at the, the closing hours of the church age. The rapture happens, the time of Jacob's trouble, such as it was as never began, you know, never saw that passage we read in Matthew, Jeremiah chapter 30, okay? Then the, the Lord comes back down, the, se the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's a big, that's the biggest theme in all the Bible. The biggest theme in the Bible is not our salvation, as much as we hold tight, and that's a blessing. We can never, you know, downplay that at all. But the main theme is the Lord getting his kingdom, the Lord coming on planet Earth and setting up his thousand year reign so that's where we're at his feet shall stand upon upon the mount of olives okay so come to revelation 12 we have to do some cross referencing that's how you understand the bible it's in uh you know it's a little, a little laborsome but hey come on is it is it labor i mean i shouldn't even say is it laborsome to flip and turn pages oh man i'm so tired i gotta i gotta lift up this page and turn it and find it you know like come on look at look at revelation chapter 12 Let's see, Revelation 12, page 1657, 1657. Try to make it, you know, I know those churches, they got all the verses on the TV for you and stuff, but I mean, we, I can't do all that. I can't put it on a TV. You guys watch probably enough TV uh, throughout the day, week. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12, verse number 6. And that's a blessing. Turn that thing off a little bit and open up this Bible and read it. You'd be ahead of... Fox News, you'd be ahead of CNN if you just read this Bible, took the time. Cross-reference, and where does this word show up? Where does this show up? That's what we're doing. Look at Revelation 6, or Revelation 12, verse 6, page 1657. Let's see, Revelation 12, verse number 6. Okay, so here, here's the deal. Uh, the outcome of this, uh, this war in Israel, eventually it's not going to be good for the Jews. Uh, like I said, the, the media is already working on getting people to turn against Israel, support Palestine. Eventually, these Jewish people, God's people, they're going to flee out into the wilderness. They're going to get scattered and pushed away from their land. Let's look at Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. And they that should feed her there a thousand two hundred three square days. And m m most people think it's a Sela Petra and stuff like that. The city in the rock, a cool looking city, actually. I always thought, man, how if the devil knows that, we know that. The devil, you don't think he'd send a bomb right over that thing if they're all the Jews are there? Well, I don't know really where this place is at, okay? And uh, maybe I ought to do more studying and research. Where does it actually say that in the Bible? Because we, we've all heard that before. But it seems to be, Sela Petra is an abandoned place. But it kind of says that they should feed her. So there's a group of people there. There's cavemen there, I guess, in these, in these caves that are going to, bring these Jewish refugees into this hideout, so to say, okay? That they should feed her, look, 1,203 score days, which equals 3.45 years. Three and a half years, close, close. Now look at verse 7. There was a war in heaven. When stuff's going down on earth and there's wars going down on earth, there's stuff going on up in the heavens. There's probably devils and demons. They've just you know, bloodthirsty. I mean, there's, there, I believe in that. I believe there's spiritual battles going on while there's physical battles going on down here on earth. There's a war in heaven, verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Anybody want to guess who that is? That's the devil, obviously. And the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. They get kicked out of the second heaven. No more roaming outer space for, for the devil and his gang. Verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, 
called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Most people apply that verse way back in the day. That's future. The devil still has the capability of going from the first heaven in the atmosphere to the second heaven in outer space. He got kicked out. He lost his position in the third heaven. Then God kind of stuck him in a second heaven. Now he's coming down. There's going to come a day when the devil touches down on earth. And people say, well, isn't he already here and stuff like that? He can go to and from, but he, he's not stuck down here yet. You know what happens when he does touch down on earth? He goes even lower to the bottomless pit. He, he's just constantly fallen. Then what happens when he's done at the bottomless pit? He goes to the lake of fire, possibly at the bottom of the universe. Some black hole. That's, I don't know. Uh, whatever. But let's see. Let's look at uh, verse 12 again. His angels were cast out with him. Look at verse number 10. Um, actually, come to verse 13. We don't, I don't want to read that rest one. Look at verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out, or cast, when, when he saw he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man child. I don't got near, near time for to go into that. And to the woman were given, look, to the woman. This woman is Israel. That's what this language is. It's not Mary. It's not the church. It's Israel. And to the woman were given two wings, okay, of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, that's one, times, that's two, and a half a time, that's a half, from the face of the serpent. So there's your three and a half years shows up, okay? Now, it's, I think that's always interesting is, you know, these Jews, they, they go, they flee out and they, it's like they catch a flight by American Eagle Airlines or something. I don't know. I don't know. You know, you, we could take that as, you know, a big bird comes and they, they all get on this bird somehow. And God may be able to do that. I don't, I don't, I don't doubt that for a second. But what's the chances of two wings? Uh, what's it say? Two wings of a, of a great eagle, you know, and there's a American Eagle Airlines and stuff like that. But somehow they're going to flee out of their land. Okay, now come to Revelation 7. But they're going to be taken care of. Remember God said, I'm going to persecute you. I'm going to, I got you, I'm going to whip you, I'm going to beat you, but I'm not going to make a full end of you. God always has his remnant of, of his Jewish people, okay? Look at Revelation chapter 7. Let's flip a couple pages to the left. Look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Let's look at verse number, uh, verse number 2. Okay, Revelation 7, 2. And this whole book, you know, you probably heard the term. This is the book of the apocalypse. The, the end of days here. That we're in the apocalyptic time when we're reading. We're not in it. I'm not in it. I don't got no business in this part. Neither do you if you're saved, if you trusted Jesus Christ. We're gone before this time. But the Lord, he, taught, he has a lot to say about this. Okay, let's look at verse number 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Book of verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. God's very specific with everything. They were sealed 144,000 of, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And you could read you know, on your own time, read verses 5 to 8 and uh, all that. God has a seal on the, on the foreheads of, of his people, okay, who are all Jews. The church isn't there. These are not Jehovah's Witnesses. If you're, if you're running the Jehovah's Witness, they're trying to take you back, and that's us. No, it's not, okay. They're very clear. These people are virgins. These people keep the law. They're Jews. They're of the 12 tribes. They know what tribe they're from. I mean... This is, they're not, none of that. This is in the future. And that's a, man, that's a debate nowadays is where are these tribes at? Which tribe are you from? You know, and we don't know. Nobody really knows, but God knows. He's going to seal them people. And just as the Antichrist has marks upon the heads of everybody in the mark of the beast, a, a, a mark in the hand, God seals his people. 
with, uh, with the mark on their foreheads, okay? Come to Revelation 11. So there's going to be at least 144,000 Jews that are sealed, okay, protected, all right? Um, we can, you could call them like the remnant or, you know, the, the elect or, or per se. Or, and then I don't know, probably some, some of these Jews are going to preach. They're going to have a ministry, and they're probably going to get a lot of other people. Some of them, possibly, some more Jews to come out here. We got to get it. We got to get away from this this scene going on in, in Israel. And you better believe they're going to have the New Testament in their hand, reading Matthew, reading all these passages, and God's going to help them. He's going to give them understanding and stuff. Look at Revelation chapter uh, eleven here. Okay, a couple other things. Revelation eleven. Let's see. Revelation chapter eleven. Okay, this is verse. Page 1655, look at verse number one. And there was, given, there was given me a reed, like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out. Measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be uh, shall they, shall they, Gentiles, tread underfoot forty and two months? And then it talks about I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. So here's the scene right here. We got to do more rightly dividing the word of truth. Is there is there a temple in this present age that we're living in? No, but there is. What's the temple today? Our bodies, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, if that's something that, if you would constantly keep that in mind, uh, you, would, you wouldn't act any different than you did in church compared to when you left church. You'd be the same person. You wouldn't be a hypocrite, right? Uh, if you kept that in mind, it's pretty much on all the ground in which you stand is holy ground. Don't matter if you're in this church building or if you're outside walking somewhere else at work or in school or wherever you're at. you got to keep that in mind. That's why Paul constantly reminded the, the Christians, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you defile it, he'll, you're, you're, you're wreck your life. And God will, God will him, shall, the, him shall God destroy, <laughs> the Bible talks about. So um, that's, that, that's, this, this, this church, this is not the temple. This is just a building. A brick and mortar and stuff like that that's eventually going to burn down one day. But our bodies are the, are the temple right now housing the Holy Spirit. But there comes a day, okay, in the tribulation period where these Jewish people get their temple back, all right? And uh, they, they go, it, it does go back to temple worship. Now, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15, where we started, is when you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, when that happens, you got to get out of there like ASAP, okay? you got to go back and read. Who, whosoever read the book of Daniel will understand it. Now, come to Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul understood it. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's page number 1577. And we'll go here. I'm going to skip some, and then we're going to give you a couple verses on, the, on peace. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians. So in the tribulation period, there's going to be a temple that's, that's going to be built. And uh, it'd be pretty interesting right now, you know, the whole thing of what's going on and everything that all it could possibly take just an airstrike or something. You know, they're, they're battling about who shot this rocket off and who hit this hospital and all this. And next, you know, a wayward rocket somehow hits the Mosque of Omar or whatever that mosque is, the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> Wipes that thing off the map, then it's it's a big deal. Wipe that, level that thing clean, and now we gotta we gotta build a holy site again. We gotta get you know they're already working on that stuff with, I think it's in Dubai or something. The anybody know what I'm talking about? That whole house of faith. They want to get the Jews, Muslims, and your good old Catholics, get them all together. And we all worship the same God. You know, they, they're trying to do something with, with that stuff. And all it takes is level that, that dome of the rock out of there and build the temple in which 
who's going to sit in that temple? We're going to see. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. And Paul's talking about the, the, the day of Christ, the coming of the Lord, the, the rapture. This thing is at hand. All right, it, 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 it's at hand. There's some, there's some things that, that kind of kind of happen. You're going to, you know, you, you would have saw these things if the rapture came, but it didn't come or else you, you know, you would have saw these things and stuff. So let, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, page 1577, verse number 3. Notice how Paul starts this off. Let no man deceive you by any means. Deception. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except... A falling away first. There's going to be a falling away of, of within the faith. I used to be a Christian. Now I'm not no more. I used to go to church. Now who cares about it? You know, I used to read the Bible, but I threw it away. And now I'm into philosophy and into some other stupid thing or whatever. There's going to be a falling away. But what is what's tough about this is except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So it's like if we take and we're going to preach the falling away first, there's going to be a falling away first. The question is, what, what about this antichrist? What about this man of sin, the son of perdition? And I know, I know, we try to, and we try to rightly divide this thing at the comma, and try to get part of this out of the way, and things like that. John, okay, I'm just going to throw this out. You could chew on this for a little bit. The Apostle John is a great picture of the church, right? The Apostle John, he leaned, leaned, leaned on Jesus' bosom, and the only disciple in whom Jesus loved, Jesus loves the church. John gets caught up, Revelation chapter 4. You don't see him until way later on. He's out of the picture. But you know who, you know who was revealed to the, the Apostle John at the Lord's Supper? The son of perdition. Everybody's asking, who, who's the son of perdition? You know, is it, and they're asking, is it I, is it me, is it, it, it's like they don't know, you know. But Peter beckoned over to the apostle John and said, John, you ask him. And John didn't say, is it I? His heart was right as can be. He knew it wasn't him. He whispered to, he whispered to Jesus Christ, who is this guy? And he said, it, it is he who I give the sop to and dips this thing into the cup. And who was it? Judas Iscariot. The Antichrist was revealed, the son of perdition, sop. SOP, you know, son of perdition. It was, it, was, it was revealed to the Apostle John. And then that guy, Jesus is scary, ran up and left. So I don't know. All right? and, and I know right away you're saying, I'm, now, I'm, now all of a sudden you're coming up here teaching me that I'm looking for the Antichrist. No. No. Like I said, if, 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 uh, you know, you, if I tell you, here's, here's my, my house is right over the street over there. And I tell you, you got to look out for this, you got to look out for that, watch out for this tree over here, watch out, for, make this turn. You'll see this house over here. Make that right. You're, I'm, not, I'm not taking away your expectation of you're eventually going to my house. Just the same with like a, you know, you tell that, you tell that kid that, that, no, I don't tell him it, but you tell that kid Santa Claus is coming, okay? W Santa Claus is coming when it starts to snow and when, when you see the lights coming on, everybody's putting out these decorations. Are you taking away that kid's expectation of some fake, fat, phony coming down the chimney <laughs> no you're you're not but you're getting people to look to to expect to to really encourage them to man we're getting close i'm so by no means i'm not trying to get you to to look for those things but that's something to to chew on for a little bit all right i i, I can't be super dogmatic about all this but verse four what's this guy do verse four who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth where? Sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. And it's what this, what this seems to be is, when, like we read in Revelation chapter 11, when this temple's built, okay, there's there going to be a guy that sits in there. And he's going, to really, he's going to magnify himself above everything. He's going to say there's no more Jesus Christ. There's no more um, Buddha, Buddhism. There's no more Muslims. There's no more Allah. There's no more all these gods. I'm the guy. I'm who you've been waiting for. And he's going to magnify himself above all gods. 
And that's the abomination of desolation. I mean, and when he sits, he, I don't know if he sits on the mercy seat or whatever, and just blasphemes the temple because the Jews do not believe in a, when, when some of the Jews see this, they're going to say, we didn't sign up for this. We, we, we thought we built the temple and we're going to get back to all of our Old Testament stuff. But when a guy comes in there and says, I'm God, they're going to run, they're going to, the next thing you know, you, you convert or die. Mark of the beast and all that stuff that has to happen. So um, that, that's, that's what's going to come to, uh, with, with Israel. I, I got some more here, but we're going to stop. It's 1230. Um, we didn't really get into the, the, peace of, the peace of Israel. Maybe I'll just run through it in five minutes. The peace of Israel. Okay, let me give you some good news before you walk out of here. <laughs> you see all this doom and gloom stuff. But here, here's what the Bible says. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, this is a famous Christmas card verse. You know, about, uh, you open up the Christmas card, it says, for, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, the Mighty God, and then the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. So peace is not going to come to the Middle East by the United Nations. It's not going to come through good old Donald Trump. And it's not going to come by anybody. There's going to be fake peace that shows up by the Antichrist. Okay, There's, the, only, the only way that this world's ever going to know peace is when the Prince of Peace comes back. In the, and it said the rest of that Bible verse says the government shall be upon his shoulders, Jesus Christ's shoulders, which it's not on today. Okay, So we, we, we read that there's a verse in Psalm 122, verse 7. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, not, we, we, that's sad what the, what's going on. But really what we should be praying for is that for Israel to be saved, like Paul prayed in Romans 10, not even the Pal even the Palestinian, everybody, ever, whosoever needs to get saved and trust the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? Um, but when it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're, that prayer is not going to get answered <laughs> until the second coming. I'm not saying, I'm not telling you don't pray that prayer or whatever, but you might not see the answer anytime soon. You're, but it's going to get answered when the Prince of Peace comes back and sets up his kingdom uh, in, in Jerusalem. And in Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 17, let's, let's, look at, let's, let's close on that because this is good stuff too. Isaiah 54. All right, Isaiah 54. I'll give you some good peace talks here. Look at Isaiah 54, verse number uh, Verse number one, Isaiah 54, verse number, uh, let's, let me skip through some of this. Verse number uh, six, let's go to verse six. We'll skim through some of this. This is a good, good chapter to read when you get home or something. Isaiah 54, look at verse number six. For the Lord hath called thee, Israel, as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and the wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Remember the woman that flees into the wilderness and all that? Um, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. I'm come up. The Lord's coming back to the nation of Israel, okay? Let's see, what else? Um, verse 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. Remember the flood? God said, I'll never flood the earth again. Like that, a global flood. So have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. The topography of the earth is going to be destroyed and wrecked. <laughs> mountains are going to depart. Hills are going to be leveled flat when the Lord comes back. The, the earth is going to be a wreck. What, what happens when the Lord touches down on Mount Zion? It cleaves in two. He's splitting mountains. I mean, that's God. He'll, he'll split, the, he'll make the Mount Everest look like a little molehill if he wants to. <laughs> he could do that. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's amazing. You know, that's pretty wild stuff. So all that's going to happen, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Verse number seven, uh, let's see, verse number 14. How about this one? In righteousness shalt thou be established, 
No more sodomy. No more wickedness. No more terrorism. Okay? Thou shalt be far from oppression. No more getting oppressed by people and things. Yeah, for thou shalt not, uh, for thou shalt not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. And then verse number uh, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And we like to use that for ourselves, but it's not for us. <laughs> it's for Israel. I don't care, you could come at them with AK-47s, you could come at them with nuclear arms, you could come at them with lasers from outer space. But when, when, this, when this all finishes, no weapon that's formed against the nation of Israel is going to prosper. And I know we could devotionally apply that stuff and, you know, things like that. But we're talking doctrine here, okay? So the Muslims, the Palestinians, terrorists, any Gentile nation that comes against Israel in the last days are fighting against God. And do you think the Lord is going to allow them to win the war and erase the Jews off the map? No. Not if you read your Bible. You know, it's not going to happen. And then at the, at the very end, close on a good note here. You better close your Bibles. I, okay, so just like last week, we talked about all the wars in, uh, in Israel, and we looked at a bunch of them and how, how they just seemed to squeak by at the last end of it all. So when all hope seems to be lost with, with the nation of Israel, like what are we going to do again? We find ourselves with our backs against the wall again. I'm, I'm, a, I'm in a rock city. I'm in a, the devil's coming after me. What happens at the end of the day? The Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see him. They shall wail because of him, you know. And the Lord comes back, Revelation 19, in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. He comes back again. And at the last moment, when they think all hope's lost, behold, their king cometh. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Thing, it, what, a, what a book. God, know, God knows how to write a book, all right. <laughs> He sure does. He knows how to. He knows how to wrap this thing up with a good ending, and I'm blessed. To, blessed to be able to have it and preach it. Let's bow our heads. And let's close in prayer. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much, Lord, for this uh, this study um, for the past couple of weeks of your people, nation of Israel, uh, Jerusalem, Lord, the Jews, and uh, the wars going on, Lord. It's amazing um, how this book is way ahead of tomorrow's news and everything lord it's way ahead of it we're very thankful lord that we um we have the answers in here very, i'm very thankful personally that i know the answer which is you I'm thankful lord that you came down and died for my sins and was buried and resurrected the third day for my salvation and um lord i'm just thankful that i'm on the winning side there's gonna be a lot of people in this when this day comes lord and you come back uh, they'll be on the losing side and i pray lord that we don't have any losers that that, that that listen and that are hearing this message lord i pray right now that they understand that they're a sinner and uh they they can't work their way to heaven but i pray that they understand that you already worked it out for them and two thousand years ago you came down and uh, died on that cross and shed your blood for them it was personal you did do it for them for every single sinner lord and then you were buried and then you were resurrected the third day according to the scripture to prove that you have power over death and over hell. And I pray, Lord, that if there be a soul that is unsure where they're going to go when they die, I pray right now that they um, put their faith and trust and call upon you as their Lord and Savior and trust the gospel of salvation to save their soul from hell. I pray, Lord, that you deal with them, those people, convict their hearts, and um, ultimately, Lord, that they make the decision to trust in you. We thank you for your book, Lord, and uh, we love you. And just lead us and guide us as we go about our weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Oh, we're going to stop there for this morning. We're, um, did Je Zoe turn on uh, any speakers? You guys want to sing a song at all? You guys sing a song? Let's stand up. Let's sing a song. Let's sing page number, uh, let's sing page 496. Okay. Let's sing let's sing that real quick. Let's sing page 496. Page 496. In the red hymnal. Page 496 in the red hymnal. And we'll do you want to play this one, Shelley?
All right, page 496 in the red hymnal. Let's sing it all nice and, nice and loud. Page 496, red hymnal. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3. That's all we talked about this morning. It's a good song to close on. We know we got the victory in Jesus. Page 496. Verse number one. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Verse 2. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Amen. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me there, I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Finish on three. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for hanging with me this morning. We're dismissed. All right, John Paul, you want to cut the, cut the camera there? All right, I gave you a lot of...